And now it's my pleasure to get us started with the keynote conversation presented by Amarillo National Bank with Hamdi Ulakaya, the founder and CEO of Chobani Yogurt. He's a special person who embodies so much of what this country means. Hamdi Ulakaya built Chobani, one of the fastest growing food companies in the last decade, from humble beginnings. I go back to my childhood early days. It didn't matter you know, you were poor or rich or farmer or lived in the city. You couldn't imagine a table without yogurt if you were growing up in Turkey. The same thing in Greece. Ulakaya says the traditions he learned as a farmer laid the foundation for his business. I'm a farmer. I grew up in a farm. My family, my grandfathers, all of them. When I arrived here, I worked in a farm for a year and a half. You care for your animals before you care about your own family. From farmer to CEO, Ulakaya is putting people at the center of his business. This pandemic showed us that investing in our people, investing in our people's livelihoods, and their families, it is the most fundamental investment you can make for your business in a good days and a bad days. Building a yogurt empire with culture at its core. Welcome to the Bush Center, Hamdi Ulakaya. Thank you. And I should say welcome back because you were awarded an honorary degree from SMU in 2019. Yep. And so um, uh, no one can take that away from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, this background minute uh, gave people a glimpse. But I would like to start with a 22-year-old Kurd who grew up in eastern Turkey writing for a political leaning newspaper gets picked up by the Turkish police and that changed your life. Yeah. Um, take us back to, uh, to, that, to that time in your life. I was, it, was, it was very scary um, because I, before that happened to me, I've heard that happened to a lot of people I knew. Um, and, and, you know, the emotion that you go through um, and you're alone and and knowing that what ha you heard that happened to all the other friends that you had is going to happen to you, um, it's 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 extremely um, scary moment. Um, when I left from there, the person said, "No one has left this building the way that you're living right now," which was true because the stories was telling that it was a lot worse. Um, the moment I left from there, that I knew that life from that moment on is not going to be the same. But my mother. Um, uh, would not allow me to go to the most extreme, which some of the people went to, you know, mountains and some arm fightings and all that kind of stuff. So I knew my way was to get out of the country. Um, and, and your first inclination was to go to Europe. Yep. And I think you, somebody suggested America, and you said, why would I go there? Capitalism was the reason poor people suffered. Yeah, well, I would, well, I would I go to this imperialist, capitalist place where it's the source of all the problems, you know. And that's what I was, you know, reading in the books at the time. Do you still talk to your friends back then? <laughs> <And>, uh, <laughs> they, think, they think I sold my soul to capitalism. <laughs> um, and a stranger who used to uh, shop in my brother's store, a small store, that never talked to me before, uh, said, go to America. I went to school there. I'm an engineer. Uh, and that's where you must go, not to Europe. Um, after I made that comment, the, night, the day after, I went and waited for that gentleman to show up. And he's the reason I'm here today. Yeah. So you came to the United States to study English, and you ended up in central New York um, making, some, making cheese, teaching an instructor how to make cheese. Before that, actually, it was a homework, and my teacher gave me how to write uh, in Baruch College. And I tried to write in English how to make cheese. And this Italian short, very um, you know, loud woman, she, she, she was telling me something. I couldn't understand if she was angry with my paper. She had her paper in her hand. And did I write something wrong, or did I say something bad? And I brought another Turkish guy to explain to me what she was saying and find out that she had a farm in upstate New York near Vermont border. And she was inviting me to go there and make cheese with her. And I was like, is this is real or what? I couldn't believe what she was saying. And I went there that weekend, and soon enough, she had a husband from Ohio, tall guy, um, a mule, 25 goats, 50 cows, a beautiful farm next to the river. 
and we made cheese uh, together, and we made fire. Um, and I told them that I would love to work for them in the farm for free if they would allow me to stay there. And they did. And I worked in that farm for a year and a half while I was driving to SUNY Albany to learn English. And I did everything, milking cows, cleaning the manures, um, interacting with the other workers. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, you will appreciate this story. If I, I always tell this story to the farmers. I never tell them anybody else because it's pretty um, disgusting in a way. But um, <laughs> so in the farm, um, not only you make the cows and do all the all the things which I did in my previous life, but then you have to clean the manure. You, you know what manure is, right, Ken? <laughs> Um, only farmers know, you know, dealing with the manure. So I, you have to load the manures into the tractor, and then you have to drive to the farmland, and then you have to spread it. And this spreader was a very old spreader, and the tractor was too. That we had no cap, and then the cylinder in the back you had a stick. You have to reach the stick once you make it to the farm, to the land, and you, you know, pull the stick, and then thing spins, and then. Uh, spreads the mineral to the land. Now I made it to there and I forgot what the owner told me if he was, he was supposed to pull it or push it. <laughs> and, and there is no way avoiding it because you have to reach the stick and I'm on the land and you know now I think I could have come up with a better idea to how to do it but I pulled it and this thing spins so fast and soon enough, I was covered with <laughs> it spin the wrong way. So I was covered with the manure from head to toe. Only thing I had to do is I closed my eyes and I opened it. So I got off the tractor, and there's the lake. I'm covered with manure, but I don't know how to swim. And the lake is deep. I come close to the lake. I says, do I jump into the lake, clean myself, possibly die, or do I stay with the smell? <laughs> so I wash my hand, and I stay with the smell. I take my clothes off. I get on the tractor, and I'm driving down, <laughs> na half naked, covered with manure. And if Mr. President would see that picture, he would say, OK, that boy is going to be all right. <laughs> 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 or you could hear the founding fathers would say, welcome to America. That's, that's, how we, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do to people. <laughs> um, you could only go up from now on, that's right? right. <laughs> uh, but that farm, it was. The, the source and the beginning of my life. It's transformed and changed my life. And, and that farm was the place, and that community was the place I got to learn America. Right. And I got to love America and, and the people of America. Um, I did not have that picture in New York City, but that was a magical place. Right. Yeah. And so, so then you started a small little cheese company. Yes, sir. Um, and I don't want to belabor that because the story is so great what followed. But junk mail changed your life. Yep. So how can somebody who had been previously covered in manure focus on junk mail? <laughs> and that is, um, I think it goes back to my, my life as nomad. I, I, I think we were so aware of our surroundings. And I recognized that mail. I throw it in the junk. And I picked it back up. And 20 minutes later, I called the number. And I was curious enough to go and see what this was all about. Um, and and I, I did. And it turns out that this was an old, old factory, almost 100 years old. And they were closing it. By, Kraft was closing it. And all the workers, around 55 of them, were cleaning up, turning the lights off, you know, uh, and, and packing the last products. And Rick, who was the production manager at the time, gave me the tour of the whole plant. Um, and that also has changed my life from that moment on. And when I left the factory, um, I, call, I called my lawyer, Mario, and I, I tell this all the time. And Mario now says, I wish I had invested with you back then. He said, Hamdi, the largest food company in the world, one of them, is closing this factory, getting out of yogurt business. Who, who do you think you are? And he used the F word. He says, who, you, who do you think you are? And then later on, he said, Hamdi, you don't have money. Um, you haven't paid me in the last six months, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and these two bankers, um, uh, Pat Mucci and John Ryder, I will never forget these two uh, uh, regional bankers, um, told me that about SBA loan, 
a small business administration that would give 50% loan guarantee for starting up businesses in the rural communities. And I wrote my first time ever, I wrote my business plan, okay, and, and August 15, 2005, I had this key for this old factory. And the first day I hired four people, Maria, Rick, that who gave me the tour, um, Frank, who would take care of the uh, wastewater plant, and, and, and Mike, who would be the uh, uh, maintenance guy. And that was my first board meeting. <laughs> and in our first board meeting <laughs> in August 15, um, Mike said, Hamdi, what do we do now? And we're sitting in a, on a table, around a table, the chairs are all over the place, I mean, this is cemetery. It reminds me, my old town, that when somebody died in the Euphrates River, that town will have this heavy air. Um, this was the source of that town. I mean, more than you talk to people, you realize how important the steam that come out of this factory was important for these people. And here I am, you know, with a guy who's broken English, doesn't even have a right nice car, and and. My first idea was we, we paint the walls. Mike said, Hamdi, that's fine. We haven't painted those walls for the last 20 years. He worked there for 35 years. And he says, we haven't painted those walls in the last 20 years that I can remember. Tell me you have more ideas. <laughs> and the reason he was asking me if we have more ideas because everybody was looking to save themselves, to move and find jobs and go somewhere. And the guy is wondering, should I believe him and stay or should I just get the hell out of here too? Right. Uh, and we painted those walls that summer. Um, but I didn't have a clear plan. I really didn't. Right. All I was following is my gut feeling. Right. And your feeling was to make yogurt the, the way you're, you did growing up, the yes. way you had had it growing up. Yeah. And it was a challenge for the American palate, let's say, that it was not what, the, what was stocked on the shelves in the grocery stores. It's not what the yogurt industry was producing. Obviously, this big, huge plant that you were able to purchase for less than a million dollars. Yep. Um, you walk in, there's four or five people. Your first hire was a master yogurt maker from Turkey. Yep. I didn't know there was such a thing as a master yogurt maker. But so talk about, talk about your challenge in really saying, I'm gonna do this differently than this massive company that couldn't make a go of it. Yep. Um, and both sides. I said, I'm gonna make it different with the product because I thought America had a very, really bad yogurt. <laughs> Um, and how I operate, that I don't want to be the person that part of the company that closed this factory, abandoned this community, abandoned this people. People. Now, I know how to make yogurt, but I've never been in a business environment. I've never studied business. I've never worked anywhere other than my, my family and a little bit of cheese factory. So I did not have a blueprint. But those are the two things that I had. Because growing up, I really didn't like business. I, I didn't like CEOs or businesses, I mean, I, I, it was so distant from me. But ex exposing to people in, in upstate New York and knowing that people who had wealth, they were also kind, good human beings and people that were different than when I grew up. So, and those were the challenges. Second one is I had no experience. I didn't have people who had experience. I have not, almost no money. Uh, starting businesses in retail is extremely challenging. It's the playground for big companies. We have a factory who's been there for a long, long time and shut down. We don't know if we can turn it back on. We are four people. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the challenges are enormously big. Uh, our chances of success is very, very tiny. What I'm betting on, I'm betting on the people I saw, how they were working so hard closing that factory. And I came back to that motion of, if they work so hard to close this factory, what would they do if we turn it back on? And then the magic started. Um, I, I think through this journey, what I have seen in that plant, in that community, from the summer of 2005 to starting Chobani to 2007 and to 2012, miracles uh, happened every single day right. in, in the most basic, most amazing, most profound way. And has dramatically affected me. So forget about billions of dollars of yogurt sales or, or even my picture that President Bush painted. Um, we'll get to that. At <laughs> that 
gift that this country has given me to be part of that journey uh, has been the most amazing gift. Well, and the community of South Edmiston, New York, which is not a big place, no. um, so they are relying upon the factory in many ways, and, and so you had to make a strategic decision, and this is what, for somebody with no business training, and, and I, I want our audience to appreciate this, but you turned down initial sales that wanted to put it into specialty stores that was kind of $5 a cup, priced at 4 or $5 a cup, and you said, no, I want to be on the dairy aisle yep. for about $1.50 a cup, which yep. is a little bit higher than, the, than regular, yep. but you held out for a startup to say, I'm going to turn sales down because yes, I want to hold out for the, for the big retailer, and I'm not going to be pigeonholed into a specialty store. How hard was that to actually turn really down hard. sales? And it was not a, I would sell more on a dairy aisle. That was not the reason. I was just angry that, that you had to be in a big city and a fancy store, and you had to have certain kind of type of income to be able to buy a cup of yogurt. Like, why is that has to be a representation of your, your status? Why am I a factory worker or a teacher couldn't just get a cup of simple cup of yogurt? And that's what I grew up. I mean, we didn't have much, but at least we could get a yogurt or tomato <laughs> or pomegranate and a little bit of honey and a good taste in bread. Um, so that was my, my thing, that this natural organic, I have nothing against it, but if it's going to separate people having access to it, I'm against it. So it was a push, and some big retailers said, well, if, if you don't let us put it in there, we're not gonna buy it. But God bless, you know, Carl O'Brien, who is my first sale guy, um, uh, he, he was this, you know, unstoppable, you know, <laughs> convincing person. And he convinced, in the first couple of stores that came in, uh, they, they proved that these things work, and then that was, that was it. That was great. Now, you, you described yourself, when we saw it in the video, as a, you've described yourself as just a, farm, a farmer, but you're also a very fierce competitor. Um, are those compatible or incompatible? How, how do you make them compatible? Meaning? Well, the, the, your, you've been, your background as a farmer at the time, you now have to crack a market, which yep. is hard. Yep. And you have to displace somebody who's on that shelf. Yep. And it's not about having more sheep or you know, putting more product out. You actually got to wedge it in. Um, how did you make an enemy or a, or a, or a competitive? Uh... I, I had a competitive advantage because of the people. And, and I, I really recognized the value of the people. And I knew when I started, it was going to go until the competitive, the large multinationals was going to come. And they're going to come with just two lines. One is, I'm going to give you a really big chunk of money to buy what you have started. Or I'm going to start the same thing that you have started. So you have very little resources. When I come on, I'm going to come on with marketing dollars, right. big factories, promotions, and all that kind of stuff. So you have no place to go. And I said no. I said no to in so many different languages, including French. <laughs> and, but every time I said no, I knew my life was going to get really, really hard. Um, but I stayed in that factory from 2005 and then 2007 until 2012, and there was only a few days that I have left it. My competitive advantage was the people and the product and the plant. So if I could focus on that, the rest would work itself out. And I, I, also, uh, uh, I also bet on people, when would they eat this product and they will tell all their friends and family and that would be the, my biggest marketing. And um, so let, let's talk about people because one of your, one of your strategies um, or what, was it a, was to focus on the refugee community that was in central New York? Yes. That was a, a hardworking pool of labor, yep. um, and that changed. That became part of the culture 100%. of your organization. One hundred percent, and that became a really powerful engine. What happened is I hired everyone who used to work, and then I had everyone who wanted to work, and then most of the community was already working as contractors and electricians and you know all the other stuff. So I. I went a little bit further and further and hit the town called Utica, which I used to live. Is this beautiful little town, um, Polish, Italian, Jewish. But then it was empty, then it was settled by refugees. And then the refugee center said, we have so many people here settled by the US government, but we have no place for them to work. And this is 2008, 2009, where there is you know, economic also uh, uh, you know, downturn. And 
Challenges were they don't speak English, they don't have cars, and they don't have trainings. Okay, <laughs> these are simple to fix. <laughs> so we get- Sounded like you when you started. Yeah, we get cars, <laughs> we get translators, and we train them in the factory. So let's get them in. And in the South Edmiston, until I showed up, the only other immigrant, recent immigrant they had been interacting with was Frank, Frank Bayo. He's from Sicily, he was passing by, he saw that there was no pizza shop, he opened the pizza shop and married the local girl and he stayed there. I was the second guy who had an accent. So he says, Hamdi, I was the king until you showed up. Um, so now I'm bringing people from Asia, Africa, Middle East, that they had never seen. And people have concerns. It says, are you going to be all right in the factory floor? I said, I trust my people. Uh, and I trust the culture of this community. And this is going to be not OK. It's going to be most beautiful. So we start having 19 different nationalities, 16 different languages and with the locals, and start making yogurts and blooming, you know, building this factory. And they did the same thing in Idaho. Uh, and that gave me you know, some ideas. I was like, whoa, 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 there's something here that this um, you know, people interacting with somebody else's um, stories, that, you know, dramatic, difficult stories, and how meaningful it is to be safe, how meaningful it is to be in a community and have a job and provide to their children is actually is something that we take it for granted. Right. And it's extremely meaningful. So the people in that community, so being interactive with those uh, stories and those personalities um, affected that community in a very dramatic, very beautiful way. So yes, that immigration, refugees, and the locals, and you know, we fixed that factory and brought back to life. By fixing that factory, we actually fixed ourselves. Mm -hmm. We fixed our community. Because the last person left and told the community, you're not worth it. It's your fault. Um, by fixing this, we told our children, yes, we are worth it. We told our children, we don't need you know, fancy things. We can build this factory, we can come up with a product, we can ship it all across the country, and we can compete with the big guys, and we can win. And we can do it in the right way, by building in the right way. Um, and that brought uh, this amazing energy. And that energy, that's that immigration, that's that immigration spirit, yeah. immigrant spirit that shows up in this country and says, we're gonna make it. So let's shift gears a little bit to that story. Uh, we have, a, uh, we have a, a, a book that's going to come out by our resident artist here um, at the Bush Center who told your story with his paintbrush. So what do you think of his, um, what do you think of his handiwork? Well, I, when I met him first time, <laughs> uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Laura Bush and him in the club when I came to the city, um, I was so you know, nervous to meet with him, of course. You're meeting you know, a president of the United States. And that moment of him greeting us and sitting around this table, him interacting with the waitress and how he's talking with us, that hour or 15 minutes or whatever that was is probably one of the most profound lessons that I had of leadership. And also aligned with America that I know, that I fall in love in upstate New York. And, and now I'm looking at, at this, of course, I've, I've never had my, my, my picture painted before, and, and yet being printed by the uh, you know, President of the United States, the most amazing man, is, is, is a gift of this country for me. And it's a very emotional. I, I, of course, I will carry this with me, but what I think about it before I came out, I thought about it, is my sons are going to have this, and his, his sons, his daughters are going to have this. And, and this is you know, not only a gift for me uh, uh, personally, but it's a gift for my generation that come. And also, it will remind me that, that the value of this country, not only for the citizens that live here, but the promise that it gives to the whole humanity around the globe, which has been uh, forever. As someone, a shepherd's son from the eastern part of Turkey can come and create something that doesn't even know he has it. Mm -hmm but the environment reminds him that you have something special, but you learn from your mother, your father, and pushes you. Because before this gathering, my first gathering was at 
at the Fulton County Economic Development Corporation's annual gala <laughs> uh, in a small town and small, because this happens. This is, this is happening in every corner of this country where they put me in a stage and said, this kid, he's going to make cheese in here. He just built a cheese factory. And that's why we need to give him this plaque. <laughs> and when I received that, I remember how nervous I was. <laughs> And when I get out of the stage and I remember, I want to work more. I want to do more. I want to feel this more. Because this is a very special place. And in that, in that meeting, there was Emma. Emma was a local girl who had lung cancer. And she was my first hire in my cheese plant. And when I went to the stage, I brought Emma with me. Because I knew Emma was going to die in a month or two. And the next day, Emma spoke and shake with her oxygen tube, uh, a tank. And the next day, the local paper had a headline, her picture and my picture, and receiving the, 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 the plug. And when I visited him, and her son said to me, until the day he died, she died, which is about uh, 35 days later, she kept that article on, on her bedside. So this happens in every corner of America, especially in the rural America. So what this one does is tells me, work harder. Mm -hmm. Make sure that what happened to you, that happens to others. Make sure that this magic continues. And make sure that when your son grows in this country, that finds the same country not worse than what you found, but much, much better than what you found. So this picture is going to always remind me, and my promise, not only to my, my mother that I would do things right, but to the president that I will continue to do my best. And, and you became a naturalized citizen. I am not yet. Not yet. I'm, I'm and, but when you, when you work with immigrants and you do a lot of mentoring, yes. do you think about how you would counsel the younger Hamdi, the 22-year-old Hamdi who was told, don't come here because you said, I may not come here because it's, it's, the, it's the source of evil. <laughs> how, would you, how would you rewrite that script today? I, 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 I was at the border um, yesterday the day before yesterday at Loredo, uh, visiting with the Save the Children and, and seeing, you know, I, I, I understand why people want to come here. Of course, you know, um, whatever, all the part of the globe, people want to come here. Uh, like the driver told me yesterday from Austin to Austin uh, Airport is the most, um, most beautiful country in the whole universe. Not because roads are best or the airports are best or that, because you can be yourself. Mm -hmm. You can be authentically yourself. And there's a magic to that. If you could be authentically yourself, you can create something authentic to you that you can provide a color of you into society. The magic is not to be isolated. Right. So if you ask the, the co-founder of Moderna, uh, who's Armenian from Lebanon, that comes from the war to Canada and settles in the US, and now the vaccine that we're getting, is there's, 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 there's something happens when you move. The psychology changes. Something in the brain happens. You don't see the world the way that you see when the people are in the same place. Mm -hmm. So these people move from tragedy, from you know, war, from hunger, from whatever that is, and the, the, the the travel that you go through, you, you completely transform. And then you settle the new place, then the new life starts. And when the new life starts, if it's a welcoming and comforting, like the ladies who did in the border and the Catholic uh, uh, you know, shelter, and giving the first milk and first shower and the first, first clothes, and then some others they carry, and then go to the new community, then what happens is that person is going to create something significant, whether in a small way or in a, in a most profound big way. But there's something magic is going to come from that person. So, and so you're, you talk about authenticity, and you've you created a, a, an organization called the Tent Partnership, yeah. which is interesting to have the tent that in, is so inclusive to help encourage corporate America or to teach corporate America about hiring and integrating refugees into their work and their communities. Has that been, it, that's really taken off now. Yes. Um, it's, it's a dozen years old or? 2016. 16. Oh, it's yes. a few years old. Talk about the, just the extent to which the story is being um, picked up in, 
you know, how many companies are, are following your lead? Yeah, we have about 100, I think 130 multinational big companies and a lot of small ones, but these are the large ones. Um, and worldwide, you know, everywhere around the world. The mission is what I saw in South Edmiston, a refugee, the minute a refugee has a job, that's the minute they stop being a refugee. Mm -hmm. That's the minute they stop, start standing their feet, that's the minute they stop to provide to their, that's the minute really is, is the life is the beginning. And that's the magic start happening at that moment. So I, we convince the com companies and say, this is not just good because it's a good citizenship, it's good for the humanity and community and society, but this is awesome for the business. You're going to bring some blood that you don't know what to do with it. It's going to bring an enormous amount of energy to you and, and, and the speed and, and, and innovation and what it does to the culture. And we've done scientific studies that refugees, uh, within the five years, all the investment that you make, you get it back in every level you can think of. Uh, so the other part that I was extremely passionate about is because I'm Kurd and I saw the Yazidis um, and the girls get attacked by ISIS. And, you know, and the refugee populations, you know, average refugees living in the camps in about 20 years, 22 years, the conditions are pretty awful. And the brand that is being used for a political reason is, is, is probably one of the most um, disinformation that you can think of, is mixed with terrorism, mixed with social, you know, uh, transformation uh, in a negative way and all that kind of stuff. So I thought bringing brands and businesses into the, this refugee place is bringing the level of identity of refugees into the most humane place. Um, so it's been, it's been a beautiful ride. Um, uh, we've done Colombia, Netherlands, Canada, uh, Jordan, um, you know, Malaysia. So, so we go all over the place, use the power of business, power of brands, and elevate this topic and, and make, a, make an impact in their lives. So. That's, that's fantastic. So then along comes the pandemic. Yeah. And which has been a struggle for rural America, struggle for business. Um, your response was, I'd say, instead of playing defense, you started playing offense, um, with both with your people and your, the amount of um, support you gave to the people in your companies, but also, at the same time, you, you, uh, you launched five new products in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. How's that happen? So I remember Peter is here, our president. Uh, Mr. President met him, and some of Chobani people are here. This is, uh, I get to be with you like, you know, like stage like this, Ken, but I, I wish I could tell the, the, the people we have at Chobani. I mean, it's some special, amazing people. You know, I'm, I'm against all the discriminations, but only classifications I do is there are two types of people in the world. People who work for Chobani and people don't. <laughs> so, 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 so our people are great, you know? Um, so Peter and I, we talked and life changed. And we said, we're going to narrow down to three things. One is, let's make sure that all, all our people are safe. So closing offices, you know, uh, setting up all that kind of stuff. Second, let's keep our plants going because it's essential for us and it's essential that food goes to people because at that time in March, we don't know how the restaurants and supermarkets and people, how we're gonna get food. So this is going to be essential food. We need to get, keep uh, businesses going. And the third is let's stay involved and connected to our communities. This is the time that we have to shine and these are the dark days and we have to be a light. And I remember saying this to our team and say, well, there are two choices we have. One is we will just survive through this mm -hmm. or we're going to transform. And we're going to look back and we're going to say, these amazing things happen during COVID. We transformed during the COVID. We managed to change this during COVID. I learned how to play guitar during COVID. I quit smoking during COVID. I launched this product during COVID. I mixed, I fixed child hunger during COVID. Whatever that is, because we don't ask a catastrophe, a trouble like this to happen. But when that happens, because I remember, you don't want your plant to close inside Edmiston. But when that closed 
it's, a, it's an opportunity to make it better than ever before. And I've seen it, and it happened. So we don't want this type of troubles to come. But when we come out of this, when we look back and say, I don't say thank God that happened, but when that happened, we as a society, as a company, as a human being, we changed in a very dramatic way, we transformed. And we took that to our heart. Um, I've never seen Chobani shine the way that has in the last 10 years than during, during the COVID. We have not lost one single day of production. Our productivity went up, tremendously up. I don't know how much we recorded it. Our absentee days were a lot less, 50% less than ordinary days. We had more sick days in ordinary days than the COVID days. Interesting. Even though we give all our people two weeks to not to come work if they feel not good in the morning, paid. But what the team has done is they come up with these amazing solutions and say, okay, schools are closed. We have to come up with solution for their childcare. So let's give the childcare for the people who are coming to the factory so they can have childcare for their children. Okay, they were not going to have lunches and dinners. Let's come up with a lunch and dinner program. Um, you know, think that you can think of in the, in the office. Let's come up with extra pay, extra, you know. And then the latest, <laughs> they brought the vaccinations in front of the factories with the bands and, and cookies and celebrating the vaccination in front of the factories. Every single day, our factories made a truckload of yogurt, a semi-truck, big one, and ship it at the food bank all across the country for months. Every day, even though demand was extremely high, we would cut one truckload dedicated to a food, food bank across the country. We knew the hunger was gonna be big. Mm -hmm. We launched Child Hungers campaign. Um, but the most important part is I saw is that in societies, Yes, knowing the rock star or rich guy or famous guy or all that kind of stuff is important, but what we looked up to was the nurses and the truck drivers and the factory workers. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that we were relying on. And I was pleased to see that these heroes in societies and communities in every, every area, mm -hmm. they keep us going, get the recognition that they deserve. Right. And I, I was very pleased to see certain issues like hunger in this country, it came to a surface especially child hunger, and came to the surface, and certain conversation and dimensions that happened. And the performance of the company, we innovated more product during the COVID than we ever did. We sold more product than we ever did. And our, um, our productivity and performance has ever been. And so now you've, you've with a purpose-led approach to your company, you call yourself the anti-CEO. Um, Describe that for us, and, and um, how has that been received? I, I, I go back to a child, me, growing up in the small village next to Euphrates River, who didn't like, like the CEOs that I saw from that distance, and, and came back and said, business is good. Business platform is the most powerful platform, but yet we cannot continue the way that we have been continuing seeing it. The, the, the whole purpose of business is to make money for the shareholder. That idea does not work anymore. And which was not the idea early days, just change along the way. And what I wanted to show is when you are purpose driven, when you are taking care of your people, when you are aware of your community, when you, are, when you know that every act that you make every single day in business impacts somebody in negative and positive, and you're aware of it, and you try to make it in a positive way, and when you make sure that it's embedded in every act of your business every single day, and everybody, not only just check the box, you're faster, you're more innovative, you're more prof profitable, and you represent tomorrow's companies. And that is the, the anti-CEO idea, is your people, your community, your consumer, and the whole humanity and earth is your responsibility and you can get away from it. Yeah. And if you do, I think tomorrow's uh, society is not going to accept you uh, uh, if you don't participate. And if you do, and, and, and the people will reward you. And that's the representation of Chobani today is this idea of moving humanity forward, this idea of particip participating in community, this idea of staying above and beyond the politics, but very involved in social issues, is actually core 
involvement and, of business. And I would say that's not the anti-CEO, it's actually the reality of today's CEO. Absolutely, sir. And your motto is taking care of employees, using natural ingredients, and doing good in the world. Um, and I think that the lessons that I take away are that betting on people is a winning strategy, making sure you respect people's diversity, know the direction of your manure controls, and open your junk mail. Um, I would like, on behalf of this wonderful audience, to thank a real American inspiration, and thank you for being here. Thank you.